This video is brought to you by Wix. What's up, Wisecrack? Jared here. The Office has been off the air for over six years now, but that hasn't stopped it from being the most streamed show on Netflix. Or that is, soon to be the formerly most streamed show on Netflix as NBC launches their own streaming platform, which will hold our beloved IP hostage for a monthly subscription fee. While I love The Office, the fervor surrounding it is a little baffling. Few other shows are watched day in and day out for more than a decade. The show is good. Some would say it's very good. Some would also say it's infinitely better than the second most streamed show, Friends, which tragically taught millions of youngins that you could move to New York as an unemployed actor and live in a nice apartment and do nothing all day. Aside from lovable characters and great jokes, The Office has something else in its secret sauce. Bullshit. I mean, actual BS. This isn't a value statement, but rather a reflection on the nonsense of our characters' work lives. Rather than somehow having time to sit in a cafe all day, The Office gives us characters who also sit around doing nothing all day, but this time at a desk instead of a couch. Today I'd like to argue that part of the reason The Office is so popular is because it reflects on the prevalence of complete and utter BS that has oozed its way into every single crevice of our professional lives and the economy as a whole. So come with me as we go real deep That's what she said! <laughs> into the office in this Wisecrack edition on BS Jobs, and as always, spoilers ahead. But before we get into it, I want to give a shout out to this week's sponsor, Wix. If you're looking to step up your professional game, consider creating your own website. Wix has everything you need to showcase your unique talent, skill, or business. Everything is online nowadays, so if anyone searches your name, you want to make the best first impression. When we first partnered with Wix, I made my own website to promote my side hustle, voiceover work. It was really fun to pick out a design that reflected my personality and customize my website. If you've never made a website before, Wix makes it so simple, with thousands of pre-designed templates that you can customize without any coding experience necessary. If you're a longtime pro, you can also create your own masterpiece from scratch. With free web hosting, automatic mobile optimization, and an SEO Wiz application, your website will be ready for anyone to view. Create your own website for free today by going to wix.com slash wisecrack or clicking here. And if you decide to upgrade, you could use the promo code wisecrack15 to get 15% off all yearly plans. And now, back to the show. The Office is a mockumentary style series following the Scranton, Pennsylvania branch of a struggling paper company, Dunder Mifflin. It's helmed by Michael Scott, a manager whose antics perpetually distract his workers from actually doing work. The worst thing about prison was the was the Dementors. They were flying all over the place and they were scary and then they'd come down and they sucked the soul out of your body and it hurt! After Steve Carell's departure from the show, he's replaced by equally incompetent managers who continue in Michael's tradition of distraction and doling out bad metaphors. Jim, would you prefer a nature metaphor or a sexual metaphor? Oh God, nature. On the surface, The Office is about people who must deal with unsatisfying jobs while they're made deeply uncomfortable by their boss. It also mocks familiar office archetypes. The uptight accountant, the chatterbox, the attractive receptionist, the person waiting for retirement, the unlovable HR rep, the lovable dunce, and that guy who went to Cornell. I went to Cornell. You ever heard of it? It also speaks to the anxieties about the changing American economy. If earlier generations had to deal with closing factories as the service economy grew, in the 2000s people had to deal with the effects of digitization, e-commerce, and the consolidation of retailers into a handful of competitors. And here I think the office speaks to the bullshitization of the economy. That's an academic term, by the way. That is at least the argument proposed by anthropologist David Graeber, who claims that BS jobs are proliferating throughout the developed world. He defines a BS job as a form of paid employment that is so completely pointless, unnecessary, or pernicious that even the employee cannot justify its existence, even though, as part of the conditions of employment, the employee feels obliged to pretend that this is not the case. And this seems to be the crux of life at Dunder Mifflin, sitting in useless meetings. Bo body, bo body, what does the first B stand for? What are we doing? We're making acronyms. In a job that's nearing obsolescence, following the random BS directives of your superiors. We're throwing out the entire playbook. We're starting from scratch. We're implementing a brand new system. And trying desperately to find meaning in it all. Do you find that your life feels pointless now that nobody's actually filming you anymore? Yes. 
There might be some debate whether the workers of Dunder Mifflin have sh jobs or bullsh jobs, which is an important distinction. A sh job may just suck, say getting paid minimum wage to scrub the toilet bowls at Taco Bell, but you know, someone's gotta do it. And I don't mean to say that there isn't real work being done at Dunder Mifflin. Oscar and Angela seem to be actually competent accountants who get people paid on time, the salespeople sell, and so on. But the office checks off many of Graber's boxes for a BS job. Many of its employees are aware of the general pointlessness of their work. Dunder Mifflin can't compete with the modern chains, and management is unwilling or unable to adapt. At any moment, Dunder Mifflin could close and their clients would simply get their paper needs filled by the larger, more cost-effective chains. And even at the threat of being downsized, much of the day seems dedicated to nonsense. Meetings to figure out what color streamers should be. Well, there's green, uh, blue, yellow, red something called Flonkerton, and office romance. With a few exceptions, no one seems to particularly like their job. Jim fills his time with distraction by playing pranks on Dwight. Everyone has called me Dwayne all day. I think Jim Halpert paid them to. He's often praised for being smart and competent, despite the fact he spends most of his time scheming. By the end of the day, my desk was about two feet closer to the copier. Yeah, I just moved it an inch every time I went to the bathroom. And that's how I spent my entire day that day. In spite of this, he has repeatedly offered promotions. Jim, if you want the job, it'll be his number two. Wow. Likewise, Pam spends her work time planning her wedding and conspiring with Jim. At one point, she even invents a job for herself so she doesn't get fired. I'm the office administrator. Kevin is an accountant who can barely do math. They do not give me much responsibility. Yet stuck around for years because firing him would be uncomfortable. If anyone here can make a case for Kevin staying, based on his merit, Dwight, on the other hand, revels in bureaucracy, often spending his time obsessing over the rules. Once in a while, I'll take a long lunch. A siesta. Time thief. Time thief. Fire him. Titles. You'll be reporting to me then. Mm, on the contrary. <laughs> My title has manager in it. Or inventing pointless bureaucratic structures. The only possible assistant to my assistant is me. Gabe has a director title, but wields no power, and he can't even fire anyone. In his book, Graeber often documents people who muse that nobody would notice, care, or be worse off if their BS job disappeared. Perhaps there's no better example of this than Andy when he's manager, who spends months away from the office on a boat with his boss not even noticing. Wallace does know that you've been gone for the last three months? I have no idea. I don't know what he knows or doesn't know. Not only does everyone do their job without him, rink -a -dink -dink -do. they seem to excel at it. I couldn't be happier with the numbers. While the work at Dunder Mifflin may be some combination of real work, shit work, and bullshit work, the whole idea that Dunder Mifflin is a parasite on the economy is raised as Michael explains his job to children. When asked if Dunder Mifflin cuts and dyes their own paper, Michael responds, The paper is sent to us cut and dyed from a paper manufacturer, and then we sell it to a business for more than we paid for it. To which the children point out how superfluous and possibly immoral his business is. Why doesn't yeah. the Samo just sell the paper directly to people? You are describing Office Depot and they're kind of running us out of business. The paradox of BS jobs is that a free market promises to eliminate such waste. If a job was truly pointless, he notes, market pressures would theoretically correct it. Of course, Dunder Mifflin is subject to these exact pressures as employees are laid off. In addition to severance and everything, I want to give you this gift certificate to Chili's. Branches are merged, and the entire company is sold and sold again. It is from Sabre, our new owner. But throughout it all, Scranton succeeds in spite of them never doing much work. The branch is riddled with inefficiency, not only in its managers, but in accountants who can't do their job, a guy who can't even remember what his job title is. Really, what do I do here? I, mean, I should have written it down. Qua something. And an HR rep who isn't allowed to do his actual job. Hey, Jim. Not now, Toby, my oh, God. Jesus. Get the hell out of here, idiot. Oftentimes, according to Graber, BS jobs might have a small amount of real work. 
but culturally, we're expected to show up at the office for 40 hours a week. So a whole culture of looking busy and managers making up pointless tasks fills up that time. Employees often publicly declare their jobs are truly of real importance, if only because they'd be unable to pay rent without it. There's a general sense Graber argues that if you're not suffering at your job, then it's not worth compensating fairly. So instead of optimizing efficiency, we've begun to optimize suffering. When you can't prove you're worthy of your paycheck with your output, the second best proof is your misery. So to enforce this cultural norm, we hire more useless people who exist to make sure people who have nothing to do can look busy. Michael, perhaps unwittingly, is the best example of this. The office will likely run fine without him, and if anything, his behavior seems to be an impediment to productivity. He's convinced himself that his actual job is to break up the monotony of work for the well-being of his staff. At one point, he spends an entire day trying to come up with a funny joke for Meredith's birthday card. This is from Michael. Meredith, let's hope the only downsizing that happens to you is that someone downsizes your age. But even that job function doesn't take much time, as we learn when Pam is asked to document what he does all day. Michael feigns busyness when it's convenient or when it can get him out of doing his actual job duties. I am in my office, I am swamped. I have work up to my ears, I'm busy, 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 can't step away, I just wanted to check in. For Graeber, pointless jobs aren't just wasteful, they're incredibly harmful to our psyche. He documents people who dealt with depression, anxiety, and guilt for the fact that they were paid more or less to do nothing. This, by the way, is not just a government work problem as it extends well into the private sector. Even when some employees took three-hour lunches, traveled on the company's dime, and pursued their own projects, they were deeply unhappy. Rather, Graeber says, people derive pleasure at, quote, being the cause. That is, having an effect on the world, even in a small way. Pointless jobs rob us of that pleasure. Graeber invokes Dostoevsky, who while serving time in exile at a Siberian prison camp, developed the theory that the worst torture one could possibly devise would be to force someone to endlessly perform an obviously pointless task. Of course, many of the employees of Dunder Mifflin are forever thwarted from being the cause, whether by managers, bureaucracy, or just the inanity of the task at hand. Much of the show focuses on the character's response to their pointless professional lives. In some cases, that response is them becoming the cause in some other way. Jim is bored with his job and admits that he'd kill himself if paper became his career. Well, if this were my career, I'd have to throw myself in front of a train. So he experiences agency through his pranks and revels in being the cause of Dwight's suffering. Pam has similar feelings, noting, I don't think it would be the worst thing if they let me go. Because then I might, I just, I don't think it's many little girls dream to be a receptionist. But they're able to cope with distraction and eventually love and family. Stanley gets by with the hope of retirement where he can carve wooden birds all day. Also pretzel day. I wake up every morning in a bed that's too small, drive my daughter to a school that's too expensive, and then I go to work to a job for which I get paid too little. But on pretzel day, well, I like pretzel day. And when the branch almost closes, he's elated. Oscar ends the show running for state senate, a role in which he could theoretically produce change. And even Kevin seems to be pretty happy running a bar, where he can competently bring his guests joy and not be a deadweight. Michael, meanwhile, denies the superfluous nature of his job by convincing himself of its paramount importance. But his complete hatred of Toby seems to be because he infringes on his ability to be the cause in his own office. Michael, you still can't make fun of people for race or gender or sexual orientation or religion. Who let, who let the lemon head into the room? You are a waste of life and you should give up. Of course, his goal is to be loved and respected. His nonstop narcissism and demands for attention are explained by his lonesome childhood. I want to be married and have a hundred kids so I can have a hundred friends and no one can say no to being my friend. That need is finally satisfied by quitting his job to live with Holly. But before then, he often grasped desperately at meaning by framing his job in grandiose terms. Does that make me their doctor? Um... Yes. And emulating what he deems important and worthy of respect, whether that's invoking a corporate slogan. I live by another rule. Just do it. Nike. 
directing a film, dispensing wisdom. Abraham Lincoln once said that if you're a racist, I will attack you with the North. Likening himself to other celebrities. It's Britney, bitch. Or my all-time favorite, when he attributed an inspirational quote to both himself and Wayne Gretzky. That the show is presented like a documentary only seems to further this point. Michael Scott is posturing for the cameras to sell himself as an admired, thoughtful leader. Would I rather be feared or loved? Um, easy, both. I want people to be afraid of how much they love me. Dwight, on the other hand, embraces the inanity and clings to pomp and circumstance. This all serves his warped view of being the cause. Despite having a successful beet farm, which is full of real work, he fixates on bureaucratic titles. So effective immediately, I am promoting you from assistant to the regional manager to assistant regional manager. And the appearance of authority. He revels in absurd office politics and spends most of the early seasons ingratiating himself with Michael. His ultimate goal seems to be becoming a kind of petty dictator, where he can finally have the ultimate say in his life. There's a lot of things that can explain The Office's success. Its cast, its jokes, plus that quality of working really well as ambience. But I think another big reason is just how common bullsh** jobs are. In 2013, the year The Office ended its run, a Harvard Business Review survey found that half of the 12,000 professionals asked felt that their job had no meaning and significance. Another poll found that 37% of British workers thought that their jobs were utterly useless. Graeber says part of the reason they continue to exist is because it seems so antithetical to the nature of capitalism for them to exist. After all, how could a market economy not optimize these jobs away? Societally, we don't want to admit that such a thing could be possible. The Soviet Union famously invented jobs so that everyone could be employed. And for Graeber, we have somehow managed to do something similar. Another reason BS jobs are spreading, Graeber theorizes, is the rise of the service economy. While the numbers of waiters, barbers, sales clerks, and so on that we traditionally associate with service work remain steady over time, the rest of the service economy has boomed. That boom came from administrators, consultants, clerical and accounting staff, IT professionals, etc. It's not that all these jobs are BS, but they happen to be in a sector where BS proliferates. We can break down these BS jobs into several helpful categories. This includes flunkies, employees who exist solely to justify a manager's position or inflate their prestige, goons who exist solely because other companies are doing it, think legal or marketing departments, duct tapers who simply clean up the mess of inefficient systems. I am the toilet of this office. I flush away annoying problems so others can keep their hands clean. Box stickers who exist solely to verify that some other actual work is being done that is not actually being done, and taskmasters who create bullshit work for other bullshit employees to do. As a company that doesn't actually make paper, Dunder Mifflin exists squarely in this service economy. So much so that they justify their higher prices in customer service. And Michael's own stated goal is to hire people. Good manager doesn't fire people, he hires people and inspires people. Not necessarily because it's the sign of a growing business, but because his own need to be loved is met by creating a pseudo family. I feel like all my kids grew up and then they married each other. Another reason The Office may resonate is because most of our characters do successfully cope. If we spend most of our time looking busy, The Office is an escapist fantasy where people won't get fired for only working a minimal amount of the workday. And by the finale, they've all managed to endure the BS, either by finding love or simply leaving. And maybe that's all we can hope for in our lives finding a better job, or at least having a domestic life that makes us happy enough to not care. But what do you think, Wisecrack? Have you ever worked a BS job? And did The Office help put your misery in context? Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks to all our patrons who support the channel and our podcast. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And before you go, I wanna give a shout out to Robbie. Robbie used Wix to create a portfolio for his animations. The website is really easy to navigate, showcases some really awesome videos, and makes it easy to get in touch. It's been really cool to see what our viewers are up to, and I've loved seeing all your submissions. Right now, you can create your own website for free by going to wix.com slash wisecrack, and if you decide to upgrade like Robbie, you can use the promo code wisecrack15 for 15% off all yearly plans. And as always, thanks for watching, guys. Peace.